It's six o'clock and we want to welcome everybody for joining us for a very important discussion about black art in the era of protests. I'm Robin Robinson. I'm the principal of Five by Five Public Art Consultants and I'm the host of today's discussion. Like many people who are sitting at home, uh, the idea for this project came from being glued to my social media feeds, my alternative media feeds, to commercial media. And first, watching the volumes of videos and pictures of the Twin Cities burning. And then watch its amazing people pick themselves up and pick each other up and keep fighting against police brutality and fighting against the inequities in the community in George Floyd's name. Uh, from this process uh, has been an emergence of powerful images that Curtis is gonna show us. Really, really powerful images uh, and messages being painted and spray painted on hundreds of boarded up storefront businesses in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, people were reposting them and sharing them and then started asking each other, what's gonna happen to these works, which in many people's opinion are important because they're chronically a historic movement, not just in Minnesota, but this is a world event. It's something that is inevitably going to shift social, political, and judicial power. And all of these works are the reminder. And so after conversations with several artists about so many of the issues related to these murals, this discussion was created. So what we hope to achieve today is to discuss topics related to the George Floyd tragedy and the subsequent protests a history of protest art in the Black community, perspectives from all the panelists on the activism in their work, how that work can be commoditized and exploded, exploited, and why they did or did not create work during the, the protests. And what's most important, we, we're just hearing suggestions and ideas on what should be the next steps to take to preserve and protect these historic works of protest art. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you very much. So tonight's program is uh, created and produced by Five by Five Public Art Consultants and with in-kind assistance from our numerous sponsors, and we want to tell you who they are. Uh, they are the African American Interpretive Center of Minnesota, the American Institute of Architects of Minnesota, Minnesota chapter, the National Organization of Minority Architects, Public Arts St. Paul, Juxtaposition Arts, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, MCAT, King P Studio, the Ray McKenzie Group, KMOJ Radio, the University of St. Thomas, the Ramsey County Historical Society, and the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Thank you. Now, I, I want to emphasize how important it is to have our in-kind sponsors with us here this evening. They've been a really great help in making all of this happen. But they were invited by Five by Five just to listen to what is being said here tonight. Only listen to what the artists are saying to resource groups in our community and from everybody that is listening in, all of our participants tonight. Because we want to move forward with the community and these institutions on how to preserve these works and make them available to the public with the proper context, the proper attribution and education. There are a number of art collectives and organizations that are gonna be in the audience tonight, like the University Rebuild, as well as artists like Shea Cage and E.G. Bailey, who are putting together a program to save the, the murals, as well as people that I really admire and respect, like Trisha Hearing with Public Functionary and MCAT. We're going to be reaching out for their voices during the discussion as warranted. So thank you so much for being in the audience tonight. And we acknowledge that there's going to be many, many discussions, many, many discussions on the topic of what to do with this artwork. This is just one of them. We want to make sure that we know what's gonna be done with the artwork, how the artist will be supported, and how the artist will grow from this experience. 
555 is always open to working with all groups to create emotional and fiscal equity in, in our communities. Now we have a representative from the Emerging Curators Institute with us this evening to read the questions and to share them with the audience and our panelists. We asked Gabby Cole to help us out there. So she is helping us with complete transparency in the entire program. So thank you, Gabby. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the ECI is designed to help people from uh, diverse cultures to become curators through research, professional development, and presentation. So we're gonna ask everybody in the audience, if you have a question, to use the Q&A function uh, on your screen to ask the panelists uh, questions. Do not use your chat button. Uh, because there are more than 700 people participating tonight, we're, we're beyond amazed about this. We're going to be using upvoting uh, in Zoom, and that pushes a popular or a repeat question up to the top of the list so we don't have the same questions coming in again and again. Also, we are streaming this event live, so questions are only going to be answered via Zoom, not on the stream. So you have a, if you're on stream and you have a question for the panelists that didn't get read by Gabby or you're in the, the, uh, the uh, Q&A uh, and you didn't get your, can uh, your question answered, you can send your questions to robin at 5x5art.com. And we'll repeat that again throughout the, the panel discussion. That's Robin, R-O-B-Y-N-E, Y'all always forget the E. There's an E on the end. Robin at 5x5art.com. And we can get the panelists' responses to your questions and post them at 5x5 at a later date. So before we begin the introduction of our artists, uh, what we want to do is uh, watch a video that was produced by the Ray McKenzie group uh, that uh, encapsulates exactly what was happening in the Twin Cities for the last uh, three weeks. And we wanna show everybody this video that Ray McKenzie Group has produced and will be distributing throughout the Twin Cities and across the nation. Take a look. A flag is, is drinks with our blood because you see, so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery. So we have to live on who we never wanted. Oh my gosh, don't blame the speed it, don't blame it on me. So what the young people are saying now, don't blame it, don't blame it on me. Give us a chance. Don't blame it, don't blame it on me. As we know, this country is built. Right in the face of pepper spray. So was it love at all? You didn't, but I gave my all. So don't blame it, don't blame it on me. So what the young people are saying now? Don't blame it, don't blame it on me. Give us a chance. Don't blame it. Right. That is right. That is right. And we know this country was built on black don't black people. Don't blame it, don't blame it on me. That ain't the word. That ain't the word. Thank you so much to Sharon Smith Akansanya and the Ray McKenzie group, uh, Kimberly Stewart, who also helped get this video to us. We, we really appreciate it. And it's a, it's a small encapsulation of what the world is experiencing. Right now, we'd like to go to our panelists and we're gonna go clockwise. Uh, uh, with the introduction, starting with Reggie LaFleur. Hi, Reggie. What's happening, y'all? Um, uh, Reggie LaFleur, um, been up here in the Twin Cities uh, since 2015, originally from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you know, honestly, up until recently, you know, I've, I've called this place a very progressive, supportive, you know, city in terms of my art and, and, and whatnot. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm just fearful 
you know, of, of things, you know, nowadays, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's difficult, you know, I mean, you have so much love and, and, and support and respect, you know, from your peers and stuff. I do what I can, you know, with what you see here, um, you know, working with portraiture, working with spray paint, uh, street art, graffiti, that's kind of my sort of uh, influence um, with my work. Um, you know, there's a lot of history, you know, from that. And, and um, honestly, it's just, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here, but, but you know, again, three, three weeks in and I'm still feeling a certain way about kind of just what's been happening here. So I'm just happy to kind of just be, a, be around to talk. To you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Todd Lawrence. Hi, uh, I'm Todd Lawrence. I'm uh, faculty in the uh, Department of English at the University of St. Thomas. Um, and uh, I'm one of the faculty uh, directors of the Urban Art Mapping Project. And uh, we've been uh, working on this project uh, for about two years now. Um, we started in the Midway neighborhood in St. Paul, and this project was really about, uh, about uh, documenting and uh, mapping art in that neighborhood, but we also wanted to find out what kind of relationship the people who live in the neighborhood had to the public art, the street art in their neighborhood. And we made everything from, you know, the smallest tag, sticker, graffiti, all the way up to uh, mural sanction art, like murals and street paintings, that sort of thing. So there's an ethnographic dimension to this project. We interview people who live in the neighborhood. We interview business owners who have art, you know, appearing on their buildings. We interview uh, stakeholders and the artists themselves. And I hope at some point we'll be able to interview all the artists here on this panel. This is really great to have all these folks here and be here with them. Um, we started, uh, you know, two years ago and then um, we were moving into uh, the two neighborhoods uh, directly adjacent to the Midway. We moved into South St. Anthony and we moved into Frogtown when we were basically turning towards starting to look at Frogtown. Um, that's when COVID-19 hit and we kind of had to shut down our project and sort of change it a little bit. We ended up out of that uh, uh, creating the uh, COVID-19 street art database. And that's about uh, a month and a half old. We started that back in uh, April. Has about 500 pieces in it, completely uh, global pieces from all over the world. Um, this is crowdsourced, so it's people around the world who are uploading uh, art that they see around them and putting it into this database and helping us to compile this. And so we were working on that. And then um, when uh, George Floyd was murdered um, and everything started to go down here in the Twin Cities, uh, next week we decided we needed to start the George Floyd and anti-racism street art database. And so we've been working on that for about two weeks. We've got 229 pieces in there with the help of people around the cities and also this is also a global database so with the help of people around the world um, and uh, uh, we, um, uh, we're, we're continuing to ask for people to help us to compile um, this we have a backlog of about 2,000 pieces that we're still entering into the database we're working on that right now so people who have uh, uploaded stuff it, we're going to get it up as fast as we can. I'm going to let uh, uh, my student uh, uh, teammate here, Choma, talk a little bit about the, the uh, um, database in detail. So Choma, why don't you take that over? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Choma Wagu. I am a 2020 graduate of the University of St. Thomas. Uh, this, so this spring I graduated with a double major in community studies and American culture and difference. And I've been with the urban art mapping program since we started about two years ago. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen so people can actually see the database we've been working on. So when people, I'll go to the home page. So this is the George Floyd and Anti-Racist Street Art. So when you arrive on the database, as I see, as you can see here, you can see on the side, briefly added images. There's options below to contribute directly to our database. So once people submit things, we'll look over them, we'll get them in our hands, and then we'll put them up. And when people do arrive on here, if they already know what they're looking for, they can type in terms or maybe names of artists to search up uh, different, different types of art. So for example, this one on Muddy Waters, we have a title, we have the location where you can find it at, um, a little description, um, the photographer, or if the artist is known, we'll put the artist down. And yeah, people can just see the images of it in, various angles we have that as well 
So yeah, we've been going through news articles, submissions, people are sending us Instagram messages. Um, and this is obviously, it's very focused on the Twin Cities, but this, like Dr. Lauren said, is a global effort. So if you, even if you go to our map, you can see obviously it's very densely populated in the Twin Cities for obvious reasons. But if you look at the map, if you zoom out, you know, we have covered coast to coast. And if you zoom out even further, you know, we're, we're entering parts of Europe and some parts in South Africa. And obviously, like you said, we have 2000 that we haven't even, even looked at yet. So I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that we're gonna, you know, get the global reach that we're looking for. As of today, we have over 3000 unique users viewed over across 45 countries. And even though the USA counts for about 40, uh, about 95 of those users, Turkey's, Turkey is the second most, uh, where, where our viewers are coming from. And this is just the beginning. So we're putting stuff in every day. And the 2000 Dr. Lawrence was talking about is just the Twin Cities alone. So we really have a lot of work to do and we're just really excited to share things. And I hope anybody who's watching can, you know, find our, and hopefully everyone will get an email. They can find our, our webpage and then hopefully contribute an item. Oh, uh, Robin, you're... you're on mute, Robin. <laughs> okay, there was a lot of people clicking at the same time. Uh, next, let's hear from Roger Cummins. How you doing? Uh, my name is Roger. I'm an artist and designer and one of the directors and one of the founders of Juxtaposition Arts. Um, for those who don't know, Juxta is a contemporary art and design social enterprise. So think of a black led and founded MIT Media Lab combined with a Bauhaus, where young artists and designers from North Minneapolis and around the Twin Cities come and study contemporary art, graphic design, architecture, landscape architecture, environmental design, mass production, textiles, cut and sew, industrial design, lighting. Um, civic arts, research, and aerosol writing, um, all taught by professional practitioners of each of those disciplines. Thank you, sir. Alex? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Alex Smith. Um, I'm an artist and a teaching artist at Juxtaposition Arts. Um, I'm born and raised in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I've been doing graffiti and street art for the past 18 years or so. Um, and during this past three weeks, um, just kind of been going from, from straight from protesting. Um, and as soon as the curfew hit, we started painting. And, uh, you know, we were just out there creating murals in the Frogtown area, um, all up and down University Avenue, um, because that's my neighborhood. And I felt like it wasn't getting a lot of love um, in the street art that was happening. Um, we also worked to, f we also, kind of immediately created this crew of, of black aerosol artists, mostly young people from uh, Juxtaposition Arts. Um, and we, 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 we worked on all these murals as a crew um, because we wanted, to, we wanted to be represented in the, you know, in the very white world of, of Minnesota street art. And we wanted to make sure people were seeing us doing this. Um, as someone who's been doing graffiti for most of my life, um, I've never felt a more relevant application for graffiti lettering and the, the quickness that you can produce a piece than, than these murals and, and the messages that need to go out right now. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's, that's what I got. All right, uh, thanks, Alex. I, I, I can't see Roger's face from the puffed up chest of pride uh, <laughs> that he is exhibiting uh, right now. So I know he's, he's, he's feeling so much love for, for Juxta. We're going to move on to our, our next panelist, which is the our our, our king here, our, our senior statesman, Mr. Takumba Aiken. And he's going to keep you're talking mute, while man. his mic is on. Takumba, you're on mute. <laughs> there you go. There we go, bro. Okay, I, I just got to see those letters to hit them. Anyway, um, I'm proud of Alex, too, because I remember him, say, too, and I remember when he was little, uh, doing all of that stuff and uh, proud of just the position. I'm Takumba Aiken. I'm a, a, a public artist, um, an art activist. Um, I've been doing uh, public art and art activism since 1966. Um, uh, 
and um, uh, in the Twin Cities since 1975. This is a piece I did um, just, uh, I think, a, a week ago, um, uh, where Say Two collaborated with me with his uh, uh, George Floyd stencil. And um, I just wanted to do this thing with the uh, symbols that uh, could represent uh, coming together. A lot of people thought it was uh, uh, um, uh, hands up, and it could be. But it was reminded me of my grandmother when she was glad to see me alive coming back home. And so I had people just painting and doing some of these panels that were um, just boarded up and through Springboard for the Arts, actually. And, um, and but uh, in a, on the uh, right side, you see an, a painting that I did in 1976 that uh, uh, was called Shout. Um, uh, and it was used as a book cover for Blue Visions. Um, I think that a lot of times people don't realize that Black artists have always been doing protest art. Uh, we find different ways of uh, telling the story. And my thing is to be able to um, create that art that heals and gives a visual voice to communities. Thank you, sir. Much appreciate it. We'll go back to the full yep. screen so I can see who is next because I think it is precious. I'm oh, sorry, Cameron. Hi everybody, I hope you guys are having a good evening. I don't know if it's storming where you are, but I think that's really brought my mood to a good place actually. <laughs> so I'm a rising senior, as time would have it, at Columbia. Um, due to recent circumstances, I've come home. <laughs> um, but largely my own work, I'm doing a double concentration in visual art and environmental science. And I see the crosses of those two lying at storytelling and subversion all the time. You can't make scientific advancements unless everybody believes you and that unless everybody's on board, right? And we see that right now as well. But other than that, um, the work that I've been doing is largely projections and public art on the side of buildings in the face of everything that's happening. Um, the work of young black and queer artists. Um, I would second Takumba and actually take it even further to say that all black art is a protest, is a form of protest. Um, and I see that work as anti-disciplinary, uh, referencing ideas um, posited by the likes of Theaster Gates and that artists have always been something more than artists. Um, so that's just a little bit about my work. Thank you, Cameron. Let's go next to Precious and then finally say two. So Precious, can we hear from you? I don't know if Precious can hear us, so we'll go to say two. And we're getting a little reverb from somebody. So, uh, Is Precious ready? I mean, let Precious go. All right, are you ready, are you ready Precious, to go, here? Precious? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Hey, I don't know, did everybody's screen just randomly go out and bring you back in, or was that just me? Could be the storm. Okay, sure. All right, well, um, hi, my name is Precious Wallace. I am a self-taught and professionally trained graphic designer. Um, I am the owner of both King Bee Studio and Art in Me Forms. Uh, Art in Me Forms is me um, well, King P Studio is me literally going to establishments, nonprofits, and corporations and presenting myself as being the only designer of color who can actually bring something different to the table versus just the stereotypical cookie cutter design. So if you see my design work, you'll see very colorful things. Uh, and Art in Many Forms is a platform dedicated to women of color who want to start a business or thinking about starting a business. Um, and so typically it's myself moderating the panels and taking it from city to city and using that information to actually do this work also. Strangely enough, uh, and I keep telling folks this, strangely enough, actually having a black therapist and talking to her about, you know, everything going on in the world. And we had a moment this week that still is sitting with me because, oh yeah, that's, that's thunder. 
that's wow. thunder. Anywho, yeah, y'all, I kind of live in a place with big windows. But anywho, um, and so uh, we actually had a conversation where she, she, for a moment, she took off her psychologist hat to explain Black wealth to me and the economic power needed among Black folks. And um, she recommended a, a person by the name of Dr. Claude Anderson. And all of those things around our current world and our current situations that are all representative of like who we are and where we currently stand. Um, and also to just what I want my work to reflect, like how I want my work to actually be impactful as much as it possibly can be to actually help somebody else get further in their world, whatever that be. Right, yeah. Keeping your foot wedged in that door to make sure the progress continues. Yeah, as, as much as possible, um, because there's a lot of, I mean, I'll talk about this later, but there's, I was raised a little bit different. I tell folks that, that, I tell people that all the time because my father was born in 1937 and my mother was born in 1953. So the way I was raised, there's certain things that was taught to me that were how things were supposed to be. And art was never one of those things. And I just find art to be one of the most impactful things that black folks especially can do right on yeah thank you precious uh finally uh last but not least say to john uh yeah you know next time i can't follow all these folks you gotta put me first <laughs> uh, wow. i am honored and flattered to be among uh such a distinguished crowd of folks and so thank you, Robin, for putting this together. And a big shout out. Now I look at there are 422 folks that are participating in this thing right now. So even if we wouldn't have been shut down by COVID-19, uh, we wouldn't have been able to put that many folks in a room. So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. You know, I'm not going to really talk a lot about my work. If you want to see my work, and here's the plug, go to my website, saytojonesstudio.com, and it's all there. You know, un unfortunately, we as citizens and we as artists have few forums to speak. So I'm going to take my little bit of time, and I want to make three points. Uh, and I'm going to call back on the ancestors and previous struggles as well, too. You know, and I am even going to steal a line from my first point from an earlier struggle. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to realize why and, and can't forget why we are here. We are here because of the police violence and murders of uh, Jamar Clark, of Philando Castile, of Ahmed <laughs> Aubrey, of uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and now Rayshard Brooks. I mean, that's why we are here. We, are, we need to all work toward, as artists and as citizens, on a new definition of public safety, um, whatever that means. So that's my first point. Don't forget why we're here. Uh, my second point, and I'm going to steal a line from James Baldwin. It's the fire next time. And I, I don't oh want to bring folks down. And uh, I don't want to sound like an Afro pessimist. But uh, we are here to really talk about what's going to happen to the artwork on that vast sea of plywood along University Avenue, along Lake Street, and beyond. And I would advise folks, and this is a big shout out to University Rebuild that put up a lot of that, a lot of the plywood and is storing some of that plywood as well. Um, we need to hold on to that because we may need it again. Uh, and yeah, I never thought <laughs> that I would experience this uh, kind of upheaval again in my lifetime after being in Chicago in 1968. 
and watching Chicago burn. Um, so we need to hold on to those boards uh, and work toward making sure that uh, that that folks have them just in case. And my last point, and this gets to uh, all what we need to work toward. You know, Minnesota is faced with all of these disparities that exist between black folks and white folks in health and education and home ownership, incarceration and on and on and on. And there is a disparity folks in, in in cultural resources. Uh, you know, I have been fortunate and blessed to have been able to survive as an artist here. And, but that is in despite of the fact that there are limited disparities, there are limited resources available to African American artists in particular and artists, artists of color in general. Uh, most of the money that comes from the Minnesota State Arts Board, our tax dollars, goes into just a handful of organizations. And most of them are not African American or not run by people of color. And so we have to work on making sure that those disparities in cultural resources are also, uh, that that gap in, is lessened. Uh, over time that we transform not just our culture, uh, but we transform the world and as it relates to all of us. Thank you, say too. I'm going to piggyback off that and then we're going to get right into our audience question with Gabby. But the, 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 the thing that really blows my mind, and I'm sure all of you thought about this, but thought about it from different angles because we've got different generations here, but watching what was happening in North, Watch, what, uh, watching and knowing that white supremacists were coming through near North, coming through the South Side, targeting black businesses, watching the destruction and the rebuilding. Did anybody else see the parallels to antebellum, abolition and reconstruction? Did anybody else feel that? And, and do, did we see it as like, they too said, I'm reliving this in my lifetime. And did we see from, from our younger panelists going, why did, this, did you let this happen in our lifetime? Who wants to start? I'll start so I don't have to follow anybody. Um, <laughs> as probably one of the youngest people on this panel, um, this, these kind of revolutions are something I've only ever heard about in textbooks. Um, so it's really amazing for me to be able to draw parallels. And I think one of the biggest parallels I've seen are what the rebuilding of community looks like, because every day, like people will go out and there'll be, there'll be violence against protesters. But every day, I can't tell you how many, you know, Facebook groups I'm a part of that are like, you know, we're, we're donating food this day, we're having a barbecue this day. And it's, it's not the police that are doing those things. It's people who live in the community and sometimes even outside of the community, young people, old people, everyone um, who are rebuilding their community. And if they have to protest the next day and burn it all down to the ground the next day, they don't, no one cares because it's, it's a long battle and people know what has to be done. And so that one of the biggest parallels I see are like, who is coming together to rebuild the community and it's the same people who are out there fighting the night before. And that's really been really great to see since I've never, this is my first, you know, first life experience through any of this. Yeah, so to actually piggyback even off of that, um, and funny enough, we're, we're probably, we probably in the same age. I mean, I'm a 93 baby, so hey, whatever. But um, I actually seen something that said, Minnesota gangster enough, to burn it down and nice enough to clean it up the next day. And I was, it was very interesting to see that because it, it's definitely all of what has been happening. I can't say out of all of Minnesota, but definitely when it comes to St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, and, and, and any really surrounding areas that have dealt with something in that way or in that form. Um, I think one of the things that's definitely parallel at the moment in my eyes is really when i'm watching documentaries like burn motherfucker burn and um i'm watching other documentaries on like 
different riots from way back when and this this constant feeling of this time it's going to happen like this time somebody's going to jail and then nobody that's the constant theme that everybody keeps saying it. this somehow and then nobody goes to jail and then all the black folks come together as a unit and it's like okay well cool and so it feels like like i actually sat and did the math i was like so every 30 years every 30 years there is literally an uprising that brings all black folks together but i feel like this was the first time ever that it brought everyone together to know what black folks have always always have been experiencing i think that's that's the only thing that's the same but different about this time around well you want else yeah i just i piggyback on what precious has said i think uh you know in the times in the past when these things have happened, when black people have been fed up and have, you know, um, r risen up, um, there's all these ways that white supremacy has been adaptable and malleable and has like reacted to the moment, right? In ways that it has formed itself to try to tamp that, that urge for freedom back down and to, to suppress it. But I mean, we look for, I think, in every one of the sort of revolutionary moments in black history, we look for those those sort of elements of it that continue to live, right? And continue to be sort of passed down to the next generation. And I think, you know, we, we see that in this moment. And I think we've seen something in this particular uprising, this particular the energy here that I don't know, has made some people feel optimistic that something is different. But it really is always the 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 you know the 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 knowledge, the history, everything that has come from the generations before this generation, and I think like they're aware of it too. You know, I think that they are aware of it. This generation is plugged into what's happened in the past. You know, and not and in no thanks to the school system, and, <laughs> and no yeah. thanks to like you know the the sort of institutions. Um, they've had to find it out themselves. They've had to go out and you know and 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 learn from. The, the older generation themselves make those connections themselves or or through institutions that are part of our community right so I think you know I, I'm just as a as a person who's working on like archiving this art I'm just really floored by it I'm floored by the power of it I'm floored by the way that the younger artists have some of the same elements that the older artists have and then I'm seeing that reflected in stuff that I've seen when I'm studying the Black Arts Movement or when I'm looking at, you know, the Harlem Renaissance art. It's got some of the same stuff in it. It comes back around again and again. And there's power in that. And what is that element of it that will sort of propel us forward into the next moment? Um, I think there is something different in this in this moment. Um, and maybe we can talk about what that is. But. Well, and the internet has helped to uh, expose it in a greater way than ever even though we had black photographers that were showing all of this stuff, you know, in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I hope comes out of this is a plan of people making plans and talking and working together, even if they don't agree, trying to just fine tune it and fine tune it. And one, and then one of the other things is we need 100 juxtapositions, you know, or, or at least 10. You know, uh, but we need to be able to that's, figure out ways of funding them ourselves, you know, because it's a, it's a thing of, um, uh, I remember when there was um, Inner City Youth League and the African American Cultural Center, you know, and, you know, those things disappeared after a while. But now there's so many people that have seen this to say, oh, wow, I didn't even know that was happening or that's not right, you know, that kind of thing. But when you see it around the world, the same thing that's happening here is happening has been happening. People have been oppressed around the world. But when they see it here, this is a place where supposedly it wasn't happening, you know, but we were always saying it is happening, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's because of the internet that has allowed us to be able to put it right on our face within a second, you know, that has gotten people just like, I can't, I can't say I can't believe that, but it's, you know, it has struck them in a different way. You know, I want to second that and then, oh, sorry, go ahead, Reggie. Go ahead, you're fine. Everyone, okay, Reggie, then camera. Yep. Okay, um, so I guess 
it's been hitting me a little different, um, you know, with just some things that I've just been observing in like various communities and stuff. Um, one thing in particular uh, with Lake Street, um, the, you know, like the, the, the weekend of, you know, the weekend following George Floyd's murder, um, you know, I was invited to uh, put together a potential George Floyd, uh, you know, project um, at this person's business. Um, it was on Lake Street. It was the first time that I saw, you know, all these, all these panels, you know, being put up and artists out there, you know, painting all kinds of signs of solidarity and compassion and, you know, this, all this wonderful magic, you know, that, that, that came out of it that I wasn't seeing people documenting, you know, like Instagram and stuff like that's really the only platform that I could really use these days. Um, but ironically enough, um, you know, the same business, um, and I won't say their names, um, mentioned that or the, the owners of this building that this uh, George Floyd mural was going to be on uh, mentioned that one of the tenants um, wanted me to include something that uh, highlighted this person's business. Oh, uh, and yeah. it, 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 it was pretty disgusting. Um, you know, and, and, and the amount of anger that I had from that, just, just, just that thought alone, you know, kind of just being smoking, you know, in front of me like that was just very, very offensive. Um, and then I went back into hiding, you know, I, I went back home and, you know, just watched Netflix and ate ice cream and, 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 and tried to heal, you know, um, and then just walking around this area, this area that I'm in, um, it's, it's next to, uh, Hiawatha, you know, 50th in like Hiawatha near Lake Nokomis, that sort of thing. Um, this area is, you know, no more than an eight minute drive away from 38th in Chicago, you know, where the murder occurred. And it just feels like everyone around here is just walking around, prancing around, frolicking, you know, Oblivious. Like, like shit hasn't happened, you know. Um, I still get the same microaggression, you know, from the same coffee folks up at Nokomis Beach Coffee. Um, and uh, excuse me, I wasn't supposed to be saying names, but um, you know, it's just like, I, I feel a certain way about this like superficial element, you know, when it comes to, you know, how people feel about, you know, the, the, the murder and death of George Floyd. Um, and, you know, if it weren't for Lake Street, you know, just seeing all these artists, you know, putting up all this stuff, um, then, you know, I, I would never come out. I wouldn't be on this panel, you know, honestly, so. Thank you, Reggie. Camera. Um, I think to go off of what Reggie and Takumba were talking about, just in terms of the way that we mourn and the way that we're moved to action, I think for me at least, it's been driven by the, a gut feeling in my stomach. And a lot of people like, can tie that to, you know, genetic reasonings, can trauma be passed down through generations? But I get this feeling all the time um, when something like this happens. It's not necessarily butterflies. I think it's like a little heavier. It's a little more solid than that. But that's what moves, that's what moves me when I got that news, the restlessness to just not be able to sit still, but also feel like I didn't have anywhere to go. Like that's what I think drives this movement is, it's built in, you know, to want, to be free, even if you don't even know what that looks like at the moment, You're, it's a drive. And I think that's what's moved people and that's what's like moved the world. And I also think in terms of the idea of having things being able to be shared instantly, um, it kind of brings up a question for me about like the transience of it. Like does, does something, knowing that something is only gonna be existing in front of your eyes for a small amount of time, like does that make it more immediate? Does that make it more urgent? Um, especially when it comes to art, if it's something that you know, it's something that's been made, you know, in haste and with urgency and exigence, does that, does it merit it more power in this moment? Thank you. So. Gabby has the hardest job right now. She's going to come up with a question that the panelists can answer. Gabby. I'm going to unmute myself first. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of questions coming in, but I think related to what we've been talking about, Marianne asks, how can artists contribute to building the momentum that exists right now in this moment? You know, I, I can't give real specifics, but one thing I will draw on again is our ancestors and history. Uh, one of Roger Cummings' 
greatest artworks has been the creation of juxtaposition. One of the things that we, that folks in my generation did as well as create institutions and for a variety of those reasons, for a variety of reasons, many of those institutions no longer exist and not for necessarily any fault of our own. Uh, so we need to continue to create and support cultural institutions that are framed by African-American artists. Uh, that's one thing that we can do. Now, in reflection as well, the Black Arts Movement, while it began before the summers of 1967 and uh, the revolts of 1967 and 1968, especially after the death of Martin Luther King, the Black Arts Movement picked up steam, was sparked with, and this energy came out of those times. And there was this period where African-American artists came together to work, to argue, <laughs> to move forward and try to create a Black aesthetic. And one of the things I found out, and this is a little aside, is that uh, there is, you know, I will say this and probably still debate this. There is no one black aesthetic. There are several <laughs> aesthetics that we all conform to, uh, but framed through the eyes of African Americans. I mean, so this is black art that we're creating. And so hopefully, hopefully, this time period can spark another cultural revolution that's framed by African-American artists in particular. Right on. Uh, I'm gonna jump back in here and we're gonna come back to what Say Two was talking about and that was the Afri-Cobra movement, which started in Chicago. But the, the one thing I do wanna talk about, and then I think this has piqued everybody, is and I'm going to use an expression, uh, I'm going to steal an expression like say two stole an old expression. Going back to Brother Gil Scott Heron, who said the revolution would not be televised. I would say if Gil Scott Heron was alive in 21st century America, he would have to say the revolution is not only going to be tele is not televised, it's not online either. Commoditization right. of artwork, of Black artwork, is a big, big conversation right now. And I'm curious as to how everybody feels about what is happening with these panels. Jump in. Who's gonna go first with that? Well, anyway, well, like any of the things that I would do for this kind of thing, I, I, I would wanna wait and, 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 and gather them all up and have you know them documented in a certain way. And then we have a discussion of who really is gonna control those and show those um, you know, there's always this money thing that comes up uh, and it's like, sort of like, what, don't you realize just what happened? You know, so don't try to buy me off to be your artist. You know, let, let, I, there's lots of artists, instead of being the it person, let's get the it group and let's, let us talk and let us work about it. But the whole thing about, you know, commercializing this, um, it's really, it, it, it still has a sickening thing inside of me because I didn't do it for that. And I've never really done it for that. But as an artist, you have to make a living. But if you're going to make that living, there's all these different kind of rules and different categories that we are set in. And we're separated by, you know, uh, who approves of this, who approves of that. Just like uh, rap music, how some things got taken out way out of, you know, into making this more relevant than that, when there were lots of relevant poets and rappers, you know. We, we have to really look and, and do these kind of things to talk about how we can make it important and valuable and to be able to support ourselves as well as if an organization is going to come in, they're not just buying us, but maybe paying into letting us create more. But if they're not there, we still have to do it. See what I'm saying? I, I really kind of, you know, I keep going back to Chantel Martin, and I don't know if anybody read in the New York Times what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. For the audience who may not know, Chantel Martin is, is an amazing artist based in New York City, was approached by Microsoft and McCann Advertising and asked to create artwork, specifically what they said, Black Lives Matter artwork, 
but could she have the panels done by Monday while the protests were still relevant? And her response was to blast them on social media and say, well, the protests are not going to be over on Monday. So right. it is a matter of people try understanding, but not thinking that we could be bought off so they can join in and participate through money. Right. Uh, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> can, can I jump in here on that? Alex and then Reggie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really, um, a really important point too. It's like, this isn't, the, the revolution is not going to be over in a week, you know, like the, talking about what to do with these boards right now. And that being like the main discussion, I feel like is kind of missing the point, you know, like these boards were a reaction um, to, to an event um, and a series of events. Like this is not the, uh, this is not the, the creation of these boards is not the end all be all of what's going on right now. This is, this is a, um, you know, this is a byproduct of a movement. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the best things I've seen happening with, with these boards is they've been opening up the conversation to, to people being more accepting of murals and, and artwork just in general. You know, it's like all of a sudden businesses that never in a million years would have let you paint Black Lives Matter on the side of their business are like, hey, can you come paint, you know, bring the kids. It's gonna, you know, it's like that there's, uh, there's this, there's this new, like all of this painting work has really broken down a lot of these um, barriers that existed before for for this art, and I think now we have to seize on that to create more permanent works of art and art that continues to respond to the moment. You know, like there's stuff, there's new stuff that has to be said today and the next day and in a month from now, and we have to keep creating those works. So really, like this, all of this discussion about like, oh, what are we going to do with the boards? Like it's important, but like. What's, what's really important is how we keep that, that conversation through art going, you know? Right on. Reggie? Oh, I was just gonna say, it's just crazy how people, you know, anticipate, you know, that like, you know, this, this, this energy and everything that's going on is gonna dissipate after a while, you know, like just, and, and I don't know, it's just a wild thing to, to, to process. Um, but uh, I guess if anything I could say, you know, in regards to, you know, what we're just talking about, um, uh, I think it's cool that, you know, that there, are, you know, some business owners are, are reaching out to, you know, uh, black folks, um, and even more so like other artists, like that's what's cool about like the Twin Cities is that like, in terms of support, you know, I have, you know, my non black friends reaching out to me and passing on opportunities. Um, and through that, I'm able to make connections, you know, with non black business owners and have conversations about things. Um, and some of the, the, the work that I, uh, that I've done over the past week that, um, I didn't really want to give a platform to just because like, I'm not doing it for clouds or Instagram likes or anything. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the business owners, uh, shout out to Mip, uh, Milkweed, you know, they, they were, uh, you know, using this opportunity to, 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 to give me a voice. Um, and, uh. I chose to use it in the the way that I was feeling at the time, and things were super responsive. and And again, just having that connection with these business owners um, and and understanding that, like, hey, this isn't just a fad, you know, what I'm doing. You know, I'm not just doing this because, oh, this is like the most appropriate time, you know, to to create, you know, black art or whatnot. So. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, to go back to what I was saying, it was just crazy just to process that, you know, like people are expecting this energy to dissipate and and no, no, it's not. So that's it. And right. yeah, and some of these businesses were just like hella scary. They didn't want to see their shit burn to the ground. And so they, they uh, wanted to act like they were being like extra liberal and wanting you to do some stuff, even though they might not be paying you that, that much pains on the dollar. And some of those businesses actually need to be burned to the ground. Some of them were bloodsuckers in the community. Some of them would take advantage of you and when you had to sell your guitar would give you, you know, like $10 for that. And yeah, and, and some of those businesses um, had contempt for the people. And so a lot of those businesses got, got, got leveled um, and they should not come back. And so we should be the dictators of that as well when we start to do the rebuild. I was actually, um, I'm so happy Roger said that because I was actually going to say there was actually a post made um, on Facebook about a business, I, I, it's a business somewhere over south over here, I believe, 
that they got BLM spray painted all on their boards and things of that nature. Well, the day before, the owner had just kicked out a whole bunch of black kids for no reason. So it's like, yeah, but no, there's a lot of people who just like, we want to still stand by tomorrow. So let us fake the funk. Um, that's my first thought. But to actually answer your question, Robin, uh, there are a, I feel like if the work you did is unsolicited, then getting paid for it is not an option. Um, that's just my personal feeling because kind of as Takumba said, you should just be doing the work to be doing the work. It, that it should just be innate inside of you because you want to do it, not because you're hoping that someone sees it and they hit you up and say, oh yeah, I wanna pay you, da 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 da. Like that's not what that should be. Um, and then I think the other side of that coin is if there are businesses hitting you up, like like someone actually hit up myself and a other a, a other group of people who was basically like, you know, hey y'all, we want black women to come and do our boards if we're gonna have anyone do our boards because we don't <clears throat> we don't want anyone else to do that. So it's moments like that when someone's actually saying, I want y'all that makes sense and even then for me personally i that's for me it's it's me personally i'm just more of a i would do this anyway so let me do it yeah Situ, i want to kind of know from you todd i'm sorry i'll come back but uh say i want to know because you, you did work with uh university rebuild and that was businesses what was that experience like or am i am i incorrect about that i'm so sorry uh, yeah, I never worked with them directly. I really wanted to make sure that you connected with them uh -huh. uh, as a part of these many discussions that are going to be happening in this community uh, about the status of the artwork that was created on the streets in the streetscape. So I never worked with them directly, but I gave them a shout out because they put up a number of the boards on University Avenue in particular, and they took them down and are holding them. This is a group of, uh, this is a group of theater folks, folks that were uh, laid away by COVID-19 and have not been working. So this is one of the ways that artists can be of service and in service. Thank you, and I know they're in the audience. If they have a response and they put it on the, the q and I, I, I hope we can read it out. Uh, so Gabby, take a, take, just keep your eyes peeled for them. Um, now, please, Todd, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Todd, please, you next. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, because of, you know, we have these great artists here on the panel with us and, and just coming from the perspective that we're coming from as researchers, we also um, pay a lot of attention to the art that it was done in the moment by people who people might not consider to be artists, right? Like people don't call artists. Um, some people call criminals, right? So, and I know there's lots of, there's, there's overlap in, in all those categories, but I think, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is not still around. I mean, we, we, we documented some early stuff on University Avenue that's already been painted over that already, um, you know, had uh, got cleaned up, you know, and it was expressing the kinds of feelings um, that Roger was talking about, like against, you know, toward um, businesses and and sort of spaces that didn't belong to black people that uh, that actively, um, you know, sort of rejected black people that treated them badly that that uh, didn't want them around. And here were here were artists, here were people going and saying, no, 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 this is our space now, right? So I mean, I think the power of art to transform space. You know, you hear a lot of uh, of artists, street artists, talking about how they want people to um, to stop and and to have to sort of like reconsider themselves in relation to the space that they're in when they see their work. And I think that has to be part of what we think about when you see something like a tag, which we saw, you know, one that we collected over uh, off of the side of the Walmart, what used to be the Walmart on University Avenue, that was just it just said Mama. It was just a tag. It was just a simple tag. But there's something really powerful about that, and that's gone now, right? But 
um, it's in our database and you know that's really part of the reason why we really wanted to start this project is because we saw all this stuff that people wouldn't consider to be art I mean there's already a kind of like a, a, a sort of selection process that's happening with the boards out there where you know because there's so many of them because they take up space uh, if people are gonna um, to save them to preserve them they're gonna have to make decisions right and who's making those decisions about which boards are gonna get saved and which boards are not gonna get saved? Is a board that just has a tag on it gonna get saved? That's probably gonna get thrown away, mm -hmm. right? So I think that we, you know, we need to think about the power of the art that was produced in the moment that may not even be considered art, that really is a kind of symbolic language of the kind of pain, anguish, mourning, anger that people were feeling at that moment that people still feel like that this is this is i think i just want to say this last thing and i'll shut up but i think there's this kind of almost illusion that the anger is over now right because we're seeing so much art right now that's like about unity and peace and love and everybody come together which is great it is absolutely a great a great message to put out there and i think we can't do anything unless we come together um, and work together, right? But that's that doesn't mean that the feelings about anger and you know sadness and pain and all that stuff is gone, right? It's still here. So you can't, you know, they'll try to cover up those messages, but it's still here, and it's important that we remember we still think about that stuff. Oh yeah, it's still here. Sorry, that's it. That's all I wanted to contribute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can you back you know, off that? One thing I do also want to add is. It, picking up off of a uh, comment Precious made and, and Reggie's position on painting that I'm not painting that mural. Uh, you know, each one of us is going to be faced with <laughs> these questions and these dilemmas that will call into right. question our own <laughs> sense of ethics and morals. Uh, and each one of us operates on this philosophic foundation. And our work comes, springs from that, springs from our own personal philosophies. And those are the things that will guide us. And those are the things that will frame all these different aesthetics that I hope will spring from uh, the moment that we are in right now. You know, I'm looking at some of the comments here, and there's a comment from one of my contemporaries who's in California right now, Clarence Morgan. And he's quoting Baldwin again, and kind of also reaction to what Todd had said about, and about the revolution not being over yet. This is part of the reason why I say we need to hold on to those panels, because right. we may need them again. We may have to use them again. And the good thing about, can you hear me? Yeah, Takuma, go ahead, and then we're going to jump in on Gabby. The, 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 good, the good thing about the database and some of the other things that they'll be researching, we have the documented images and the panels. Uh, if there is something that happens, we have both of them. You might not be able to recreate the ones that have been cleaned up, but we have them somewhere, you know, which is important. Like, uh, the Wall of Respect in Chicago. The first building got torn down, but there was pieces of it were kept, and then another wall was done on the side of another building. You know, and so, and then this whole thing of um, um, being being relevant, but being careful and being you know uh, honest and true to yourself and your community. There are things that I've always to learn, like what's happened now have learned that it informed me how to get back to some of the things I was doing before, you know? So there's that give and take, but hopefully there will be more gatherings and, and forums that we can talk to one another and, and have even some of the other art forms that uh, give us things too, you know, the theater, the, 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 the spoken word, those kind of things, because all of those things are gonna help. With the panels, um, I think we're gonna have to hold on to them and have a couple more conversations on what was to be done with that, you know. Can I say one more thing about the panels? Yep. Um, so I think, I think it's really important, kind of piggybacking on what Todd was saying, um, I think it's really important that we recognize the panels that people wouldn't traditionally consider 
artworks, like the, the graffiti that was happening during the uprising, um, the tags, the messages, like you said, the mama on Walmart, um, you know, the work that I saw out in the streets during those initial few days that was literally just somebody with a can of spray paint that they just got out of AutoZone and they're writing, you know, um, you know, whatever on the side of this building, like that stuff is very important. And, and I think that the, the urge to sort of uh, minnesota -fy this art movement and pick and choose and save all these boards with all these beautiful paintings on them and, and paint over, you know, I saw, I've, I've already seen tons of these buildings already painted over, boards painted over with, with, with some of these more raw messages, you know, paint over all that and save all this beautiful artwork. It's kind of like, you know, pick, it's like going out the next day to sweep up all the broken glass from the night before. It's like maybe some of that broken glass needs to be there so that we can remember what happened the night before. Just like some of those panels that say fuck 12 or a cab or whatever, those things need to be there because we need to remember what started this. You know, it's like, it's all fun and good to paint these like love, unity, peace, healing, all that. But like really the stuff that was out there when, you know, during the uprising, like we need to make sure to preserve that, um, that work too, because that work is just as, if not more important than, than something that, that, that I'm painting three weeks later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Keep our eyes on the prize. Remember why we are all here. Mm -hmm. What brought us here? Yeah, and also too in our, you know, when we had our pre-recording, um, and I might say your name wrong, Choma. Choma. Okay, so Choma had actually brought up a point that I've I've been like, that's so true. Is that when everybody starts preserving things, don't just preserve the pretty stuff. Like the pretty stuff is nice. It's cool. You probably can throw it in a museum. Um, depending on what museum it is, right? That's all nice. But like Alex just said, you need those signs that say, fuck 12. You need those signs that say, abolish the police. You need those, like you need certain signs to exist, to capture the, capture the moment in time, because that is where I'm like, this is a, a moment of history also being repeated. Because when I watch some of those documentaries, there are literal pieces of artworks from Chicago, from LA, from other different places in the world. And everybody as a unit have those same type of signs. And that in itself is a certain type of community around the art. Because if that's how everybody is feeling at, at that moment in time, that's something that needs to be recognized, not just the pretty stuff. Yeah. And I think also like when we think of like the very like large scale museums that have like donors backing them um they're most of the time they're all they're all white you know board of directors are all white donors and i don't think they're gonna want you know i remember putting in you know uh i was cataloging up it was a pig with a cop hat on i highly doubt anybody's gonna pay you know whatever price it costs to get into museum and see that and i highly doubt any of those white donors who are paying you know millions of dollars for this museum are gonna want that in there too so when we talk about preserving things i think black artists as artists of color but especially Black artists needed to be involved in those discussions um, because if when it, because it's all about the money and I feel like the donors and whoever's like paying for these things are going to make sure that a certain message gets displayed. And I want to add like um, and just like mention like the power of uh, relevance. So um, like the like the um, the graveyard behind Cup Foods like that is where it should be. That's for the people. That is that is that is like an installation that is powerful, and it would be taken away. That relevance would be taken away if it was like stuck in some museum. And then also the overnight Black Lives Matter in D.C. going down that street, giving the big fuck you finger to the White House, and like like that's a, a relevant piece, and that can't be transported in there. So I also want us to like think kind of beyond the boards, because like we're the, we're architects of civilization. Um, people like steal our shit all day, every day, and they have been doing that. Um, they they're so I must be able to like think about that, think of think of the architecture, art integrated architecture, and don't hold us to just something that can be commodified and put in a museum. Um, when these developers start developing these um, buildings, have have them include you being the the uh, artist in residence that is there from the very beginning and integrating like the interior design, the facade, like James Garrett and them at Formula do. It's like like that's super important. Don't don't allow. Um, us to be held just 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 to, just to like this like this like this just boards on a building because we are much larger than that we're 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 the fucking architects of civilization we come from Imhotep like that's 
Like that's our lane. I love Roger. Roger gets real. Uh, I, I know that Merritt Rodriguez uh, from uh, University Rebuild had a message there that they are storing uh, all, all of the uh, plywood that they have taken down. Gabby, uh, you got good questions. I saw something from E.G. Bailey and Shea Cage and Irv Dell and all these folks that I know. So let's, let's get to it. Yeah, there's a lot of comments. Um, there's comments. Maybe about we'll just take two questions to kind of. Two of them? Let's do two because there's like 47 people with questions. So we need yeah. to get to a couple. Um, Shay said, how can artists and our elders slash mentors be valued in the rebuild? It's not about us being pulled in. We are a part of the movement, but the power structures that be are meeting and devising and making decisions as, as it always is. How are things going to be done differently this time? Um, and then another question, um, I'm here to ask, Shauna asked, I'm here to ask about how non-Black women artists can help BIPOC artists in the art world and beyond. So let's start with the first one. The first one was Shay. Uh, older. Black artists, are, the older Black artists are important. And, and you know, we, we did talk about uh, one of the things we were going to discuss, you know, it's 52 years since the Afrocobra movement. And, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Curtis to just kind of throw up some pictures so we can talk about it real quick. For those of you who don't know uh, what Afrocobra is, and it was really nice to kind of get some emails from folks like, you know, that I knew in the community are like, I did not know. So now, so now you do know Afrocobra movement uh, is also known as the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists. And it was established in 1967. Many of you have seen that Angela Davis uh, uh, artwork. It was established in 67 after the Detroit riots and responsible for, as Kumba referred to, uh, the famous Wall of Respect, which was portraits that were dedicated to heroes from black history. It was destroyed in a fire about 10 years later, but it was really created to champion education in Chicago's black community and be an inspiration for more representation in the mainstream art world of the African-American experience. So 52 years from that, these, are still relevant. So what is the relevant, you know, how can we make sure that our, our senior artists who have experienced this live through it, whether they were 12 or six, or they saw it, they live it, it is part of their radical self-expression. How do we get our black artists to have a stronger voice to take us where we need to go for the 21st century? Thank you, Curtis. Are we starting all over again from Africa? Is who wants to jump in? Should, and maybe a different way, but um, I think that we have to have more institutions or we have to create workshops or uh, like um, uh, ArtSus or someplace where we can be able to teach classes and have uh, young, young people learn and have young people teach. You know, um, some of their visual knowledge, even though it's fresh, is amazing. You know, and we have to start acknowledging, you know, the young, that young voice and sharing some of the past so that they can be, you know, uh, move it towards the future. You know, my inspiration was Africa and Afrocobra with Africa. When I went to Africa is when I really knew how relevant it was, you know, um, how important and how strong and how powerful we were. And a lot of that is being passed over because we don't have enough places at which we need to create, you know, and when you talk about uh, 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 funders, there are, there, are, there are black patrons out there that uh, well, will support something, but we, we're going to have to talk about what kind of institution or what kind of summer workshops or what kind of places we can put it in where we still own it and be able to share that uh, and then bring our elders in to do whatever they want to do, you know, create the curriculum. We used to talk about building institutions. I, you know, I don't know how, how um, we're doing with that. Now, but we have an African American Cultural Center over in North Minneapolis, and there are other places that um, youth centers, uh, community centers, that uh, if we can create some programs for them, maybe we can put them in there, you know, to help just to get talent. You let them use their hands, let them use their brain, inform, just inform and inform and keep informing. So I would say I would say this. There was a presentation that was done by you, Takumba, and say to 
where you drew a clear connection between your relationship to the Harlem Renaissance and those were the shoulders that you were standing on. And so mm -hmm. um, there would be no juxtaposition without um, me being able to stand on the shoulders of you and say two. And so now it's my turn as a, as, as a, as um, a, uh, a, a new I'm, not, a new I'm, not, I'm not like a general yet, but I'm, but, but I'm getting up there. And now Alex and them, Alex and Cam and Sean going them are right. standing on my shoulders to go ahead and take. So that's how y'all are living and manifesting through, through institutions. We need to have more institutions, absolutely. Um, but, 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 but that's what that looks like. That's, that's, that's the uh, cycle. So um, yeah, that's, we definitely need more institutions. It needs to be held in black space. And that's just all there is to it. Absolutely, yeah. space that space that we control. Right. Uh, I mean, it's so key and important. Uh, just real briefly, you know, Roger mentioned this line, this tie. I'm, Tecumpa and I were fortunate to work with artists that were part of the Harlem Renaissance. You know, in the late '60s, they were part of these institutions. I mean, I went to school, and I went to school for a long time. I went to college for a long time you know, got a couple degrees. And, but I learned more from sitting and listening to artists argue at Inner City Youth League in St. Paul than I did anywhere else. You know, I mean, that really helped frame and give me, and I talked about this before, my philosophic foundation, how I look not just at my work, but how I looked at the world. And so it's, so we have this responsibility in my generation, now in Roger's generation, and now in Alex's generation, this to keep that line of continuity going, uh, to keep this discussion going and flowing and growing, uh, so that we are all wrapped up in it some kind of way, that we're all tied by this thread, uh, that we need to keep going, and we need institutions to provide that safe black space for us to do it. We need to get that kiln back. All right. <laughs> You're right. All right. <laughs> no, we need to build another better kiln. That's right. That's facts. Communal kiln. What we're talking about is an, enamel, an enameling kiln that is in Chicago Avenue Fire Arts Center, not too far, actually just footsteps Out away the from where George Floyd was murdered. Yeah, Victoria uh, Lawing's spot. And we need to have another enameling kiln. Uh, this kiln was built uh, several years ago, and Tukumba and I, and actually more Tukumba than me, really helped establish uh, a group of, ex a, a body of expertise in enameling on steel that is based in a group of African American artists. We have the market on that, on that expertise. And we really need to have more access in different ways. But that's another plug. That's another that's plug. Another <laughs> can, I, can I just say like- But that was the seed project. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I remember that. Todd, Todd, what are you guys saying? I just think that what, what's being said right now is so, so very important. I mean, we're talking about the transfer of cultural knowledge and heritage. And it is absolutely- important that we find ways to make sure that that happens, right? Um, I mean, I, I've, I worked with some uh, urban farmers in North Minneapolis a few years back, and they were talking about- Mike the, Cheney. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Mike Cheney. And, I, and people he was working with that he was getting involved in farming were saying, this is knowledge that, w that we lost when we came from right. the south to the north, right? We lost this knowledge, and now we're getting it back, and it is absolutely a part of transforming our community, right? And the same thing can be said of, of art. The same thing can be said about culture. I mean, I, I love, I love what, what Roger said, you know, the architects of, of, of humanity, the architects of, of civilization. Um, you know, Amir Baraka said that art is, vector, uh, uh, is vectors of a culture, right? That it, it's the, an essential part of what a culture is. And so we have to find ways to, you know, strengthen those, um, transmission lines, right? And to make sure that the knowledge of a, of a say to or Tacumba doesn't get lost, right? That it doesn't, that, that, that it gets passed down that line. And like Roger is saying, he's going to pass it to the next generation and the next generation, Alex and Reggie and y'all, Precious, and you're going to pass it on down. Um, the right, right. 
I strengthen those transmission lines, I think. Because if you don't I mean, do everybody that, on this you gotta panel. build it all brand new again. You gotta start yeah. from the very beginning. And that's not how the majority of the people do this. They, they're passing on the wealth. They're passing on like, like you know, not just cultural knowledge, but they're passing on um, currency. They're passing on land. And it's like, another generation cannot continue to start from the very bottom. That's just, right. that just can't happen. Right. I think that's a really important thing for, I think that's a really important thing for my generation to understand and, and remember. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, for, for my generation to understand and remember is like, exactly. It's like, we're, we're part of something that's infinite. And, and I think that's lost on a lot of people of my generation. You know, we're kind of raised in this environment of like individuality, uh, materialism, Instagram followers, like, you know, it's this clout and, and fame and all that stuff. And we're, we're, a lot of people were driven by this idea of like, as an artist, I'm supposed to just get dope enough to, to, to wear a museum or, or, a, or a gallery is buying my stuff. And, and losing sight of the fact that, you know, the goal of an artist should be to open doors for the next generation of artists. Um, and, and the art that we do is, you know, and even right now in my own practice, like, you know, when we've been doing these murals on the street, I'm, I'm stepping back, you know, I'm, I'm stepping backwards and, and, and trying to let the next generation of people have the shine. And I feel like that's something that really needs to be reinforced, especially in like the millennial generation where we're all, you know, we're so caught up in this, in this hype of social media and of, 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 of all that stuff. And, and, you know, really remembering that we're, we're part of a long line and we need to keep that line going. And it's our turn to, to pass that along to the next, to the next generation. Can it be a both and though, Alex? It's like, can I can I have a G wagon before I go? Can it, can it, yeah. You know what I mean? I don't want to just be stuck in a Civic. Right. I want I want some of the fruits too. Right. I want to be flossy and have gold shit. I mean, no doubt. I mean, that comes with it. If your work is if your work speaks like that and your work moves like that, then you know, then those things come with it. You know. And I can get some of the change for the homies. No doubt. Yes, absolutely. Gabby, do you remember what the second question was? Um, it was about, I'm here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, to ask about how non-Black women artists can help BIPOC artists in the art world and beyond. And I think we can expand that to just non-Black artists in general. You need a co-signer for that G-Wagon. <laughs> First of all, pay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we all needed that. Thank you, Roger. Um, I am. I want to say this out loud. Someone actually said to me today, Precious, um, sometimes people who are not Black, right, and this person was on the East Coast. Uh, this was a Black woman I was speaking to, but she was talking to a colleague about this conversation. And so she had told me what was told to her, which was sometimes uh, folks who are not, folks who are white, want to quickly solve the problem. And they just go and do things to quickly solve the problem. If you are here and you hear me, please note, do not go and just do something. Actually, don't do it at all. Call on your friends <laughs> and say, hey, how can I help you do whatever work that you're trying to do? Once again, it goes back, I personally feel like, to what I said earlier. Do not do unsolicited work. Just don't. If you want to help, then reach out to as many different, uh, reach out to as many different um, women of color, people of color, black women who you know are doing the work. I won't say the name. I had a woman reach out to me on LinkedIn and she said, hey, I really want to support your business at this time with everything going on. And I said, okay, cool. Here's how you can do that. And so then she, she pulled back and was like, well, I want to support you through AIGA. Well, I, I have nothing for you. Uh, mm -hmm. AIGA is a whole entire nonprofit. It's a whole entire entity. If you want to support AIGA, support AIGA. But don't try to use me as the vessel to support AIGA because I'm a black face. That's a, a co-director for AIGA. That's not what we're going to do. That's not you. you no, we're not doing that. Um, actually go and find the folks 
and then do the part of giving to someone else and paying it forward so that way they have the opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have to do that work. It's really that simple. It really should be that simple, but man, some people just... Oh my gosh! It's like, <laughs> well, let's let's like, get into it, because I, this, is, this is an <laughs> elephant in the room that everybody has been talking about, and I want to talk about it. Um, now, we showed a slide off the top, and I, I think it's critical to talk about I, 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 for full disclosure, I think all of us know Good Space Murals and, and what happened with Cup Foods and what happened with the mural on the wall. And, and it goes back to what Precious is saying. Uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate because uh, you want allyship. You want allyship. And I think all movements ha have experienced that when, when it's break, broken down as to you can do this mural, but you shouldn't, you should talk to somebody else, but, uh, but you know, this is ours, it, it, it splinters a movement. Let's talk about the fact that this mural went up. I think a lot of people like myself, who tend to be a little bit more cynical, seem to think that the mural went up because Cub Foods didn't want to have it burned down because it was looking, you know, it, it, I'm surprised that it's still not burned down. Uh, and it's still open for operation in the community. But uh, that mural went up without really discussion in the, the broader art community about how it was being put up, why it was being put up, context in which it was being put up. What happens when things like this happen? Can it stop the progress of what is being discussed right now? Can it, or does it only start finger pointing? Somebody talk, talk to me about this. I think it's really important to talk about. I'll say something real quick. Uh, yeah, you know, it happened so fast, I couldn't even process, you know, how problematic it was. Um, and, and honestly, um, you know, I, I, Greta has been great to me, you know, the whole time that I've been here. Um, and, you know, with opportunities and so on and so forth, you know, like that's been cool. Um, but really that entire week, I was grieving. You know, I was, I was sad, angry, all kinds of pissed off. And, you know, honestly, art was like the last thing that I was even thinking about, you know, in, 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 in the midst of all of that. You know, I, I was just trying to avoid all this, like, triggering, like, traumatic, you know, imagery of this, 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 this pig, you know, kneeling on George Floyd's neck, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, like... And, and like, you know, it was, it's cool, like, you know, seeing all these like positive images of George Floyd and stuff. But like, you know, one thing was just getting to me was just like, just how quick, you know, a lot of this stuff was happening. Um, and uh, in, in, in large, it was, you know, non-black folks, you know, that that was, you know, producing a lot of that work and stuff. But anyway, so I show up on Thursday and uh, see Greta and, and two non-black artists, you know, working on the project. And, uh, you know, Greta was really quick to give me my shout outs for a project that I did nearby, um, said some really wonderful things about you, uh, Robin. And, uh, you know, I kind of just kept it moving, you know, but, you know, just keeping it in the back of my mind, you know, like, you know, just sitting around, just, you know, it kind of festers a bit. And then you're just kind of like, wait a second, no, that, that, uh, that, that didn't really seem appropriate, you know, and then, and then it just kept, you know, getting viral, you know, and then I'm starting to hear more things about the project and stuff. And, and, and I don't know, man, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, like the value of art um, and, you know, the artists that put these projects together, you know, it all just was just making me sick. And, and again, another reason why I was just in hiding, you know, I didn't want to do anything because I see how people react to art and now I'm rambling. So anyway, um, that's, that's all. Awesome. So yeah, so I I would say the 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 ill thing about this is one, the mural's still up there and nobody's doing shit about it. That's 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 problem one. Problem two is that the community is you, you have a contingent of the community, and I say the community, the people surrounding 38th in Chicago, that that's their shit now and they want to keep it and they'll fight for that shit. And it's and that and so that's going to create a problem. So if you come over there and try to like do something with it, and it's 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 going to be a problem and it's going to be staticky and um i think and people are even talking about least, why, why isn't there a roundabout in the center of the street so people can drive around and put something in the center uh, center so that memorializes George Floyd. i mean it's going to be problematic period i so, like the roundabout uh, i think that would be hot 
That was mm -hmm. about good, good. I was gonna say, because there's a lot of people, as I'm seeing in the comments, who are asking, what is this actually, what are y'all talking about? Um, I'm not gonna fully speak on it, like I'm fully aware of it. Uh, I am from that neighborhood, that's my, that's my birthright. Like, I love that place, right? Here's my understanding, and anyone please correct me, because I know Felicia Perry is definitely in the comments, and I feel like she is one of the only folks I have seen on social going hard as fuck to actually hold people accountable who went about doing the work that was unsolicited and this is my understanding doing the work that was unsolicited that was not asked of the community that did not involve black artists creating a mural that has now went around the globe twice i mean barack obama posted it right so it's went around the world as many times as you can see and um after doing the work that was unsolicited, not asking the community and not actually including black artists, then creating a GoFundMe page that used to what I understand some of the knowledge of Felicia Perry's words that she created for different donations and things of that nature. Um, they created a, a GoFundMe to then pay themselves and the artists and to go on to do more murals. Like I said, if I'm, if I'm wrong, anyone please correct me where I stand. With that all being said, I'm in a place of, it's not so much contention, because I do agree with Roger. There are people who, especially in that neighborhood, will fight you about that. They, they love that mural. And like I said, it has, it's been used at every memorial of this place. And to add a little bit of insult to injury because their email was publicly made um, about them choosing to bow out and then them trying to incorporate another nonprofit who quickly absolved themselves and stepped away from it and was like, no, we, 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 we didn't know, we don't wanna be a part of this. So with all of that said, it's kind of like this in my eyes because at this point, there needs to be a solution. It needs to be either all the money that was raised in her fundraiser, she should give it away to artists who actually are making murals and being asked to make murals, or uh, all of the connections that have been made, those connections should go to artists who can make murals um, and who people are looking for. And or if everyone wants to just be upset about the mural that is on the side of 38, there needs to be an action plan of, okay, cool, we're going to go ahead and deface this and we're going to let the community do it because as we're talking about, as we're talking about public art and things of that nature, how beautiful and how important in history would it be if you could actually see a moment where someone, an outsider comes into a community does something unsolicited and the community defaces it and redoes it as a community. I think that would be one of the most important moments in art history for for Minneapolis in, in a whole entire nutshell. But I don't know if people are really really ready for that conversation because I don't know Greta. I've never met this person. I don't all I know is that it's just another person who didn't actually have all of the things who quickly rushed to solve a problem that was unsolicited, that no one asked her for, that she just said, I'll do it. And that's a problem. So, yeah, I think if I did something so foul and betrayed the community in that way, <clears throat> um, I think at the very least, you should be banished from doing work in people of color space, in, in Minnesota, you should be banished at the very least. Just go and shame and go to Wisconsin and do your thing over there or North Dakota, wherever it is, but, but not, not be allowed to make money um, because, of that be because of that betrayal. And that's, 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 that's one component. So there could be a few other components, but, but, but collectively someone needs to like take that and, and, and make that right because it's, it's, it's not gonna, it's not, the longer it stays, the more it's getting ingrained. Little kids are starting to see it and it becomes normal. It has to, something has to be done. I think this all kind of, oh, sorry. And, and, uh, Gabby, you're probably saying the same thing I'm about to say, but I know Greta is, is, is uh, 
paying attention to this, and she she did make a comment. She says the the GoFundMe was to direct all funds to local organizations. We didn't get any money for the mural, and we would never seek money from something like this. But I couldn't figure out how to comment during the conversation, and I'm sending big light to everyone. I just, can, I that to your, um, can I speak to your uh, the contention that you feel? I think when Roger was talking about like little kids are seeing it, my sister who's 14 years old, she asked like, oh, can we go see the George Floyd Memorial? I want to I want to put a flower next to it because it's become like a tourist destination at this point. There's like, there's just so much stuff that like I, my younger sister who's in middle school is like, I need to go visit the place and do and do all the things. And I think sometimes the problem when a mural like this becomes so popular is that becomes like the only message and the only story. So back when people were saying, oh, like whose art do we get to, whose art are we preserving? It's a very, it's a very beautiful mural, but it's, it's very like, it's very like nice. And it doesn't really, I don't, I personally don't think it reflects the anger. Um, and to put like a really like nice, um, a mural like that on the building, like where he was murdered, I don't think it's really be fitting of the place. Um, but I think it's, and the justice has been done when no one, when no black person at least was involved in making this project. Um, and so when we talk about like who needs to be in the room and representation and things like that, going forward, how do we claim our spaces? I think that's a thing that needs to be talked about. And yeah, people are very protective of the mural and people from outer suburbs, everyone knows the mural. If you Google George Floyd mural, that's the first thing that comes up, multiple Google docs, even though there's, I've seen many different variations of George Floyd murals. You know, one thing um, I just want to throw out there um, that I've just been paying attention to, you know, just like the type of murals that have been just out, just just in the universe. Um, been working, you know, in the style using spray paint and stuff for, you know, a little over eight years, eight and a half years or whatever. Um, and I notice um, a lot of, let's say, international artists um, tend to um, do a lot of appropriation in their works that isn't often um, challenged, you know, in the spaces that they hold, you know, I, you know, like Instagram or Facebook or, you know, choose your own social media handle. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there was an opportunity. I went to Montreal uh, with my cousin uh, last year uh, for a mural festival. And that was all cool. I got a chance to talk to, you know, some international artists and people that I've been following for, for a decade. Um, and uh, one particular artist group um, has this uh, sort of thing to where they take these like Greek mythological uh, sort of figures um, and make them look, you know, like they're, you know, like they're paintings of existing sculptures that are, you know, all white and, and that sort of thing, um, overlaid on top of you know, uh, raft tags and throw ups and all these pieces and like all this like, you know, you know, super strong, you know, graffiti, you know, style stuff. And I even think uh, some of the tags, you know, say things like hip hop and fresh and, and all these like, you know, like black, you know, like phrases and things um, done by non non black artists. Um, so even on like an international scale, there's so much appropriation that exists, you know, within the culture of like murals and public art. Um, and, um, you know, these people have followers in the, the, you know, thousands, you know, if not millions, you know, that's an exaggeration. Um, but that was just the thing I just kept noticing, you know, with a lot of, you know, these, these types of works to where you get so big um, that, you know, like one person or two people with opinions, you know, that, that, that you should be listening to gets drowned out because, you know, there's not a culture that's big enough to really shame them if, 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 if that's something that needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's different on like, you know, more, you know, local, you know, perspective, you know, and that's, that's was, that, that was the thing that I appreciated about, you know, being here in the Twin Cities is that, you know, um, a lot of communities are connected well enough to where, you know, if we have an instance, you know, such as this, um, to where non-Black artists are working, you know, in, in these public projects, um, that there's, you know, repercussions, you know, for it. Um, and then there are institutions that allow this shit to, excuse my language, allow this stuff to happen, you know. Um, 
And, uh, you know, not to put anyone underneath the bus down in Omaha, and I'll just wrap this up real quick. But, uh, you know, there was a project that I was a part of um, last year. And, um, you know, it was a collaborative gig. Um, one of the worst collaborative projects I had um, that I've ever been part of because, you know, the two artists that I, you know, that I, that I worked with, they just constantly kept challenging, oh, well, why do you want to put a black person here? You know, what about all the Irish and Italian folks in this community? And, oh, what about the homeless people here? You know, they don't, you know, they're not just black, you know, like all, all of this stuff. And, and that's a, that's, that's an aspect of public art and people's understanding that, I'm inspired to change, you know, um, at least within, you know, within my work and, and, and the people that I, you know, try to, you know, portray, you know, in my works and stuff. And I just think it's important that, you know, people um, that are represented in these murals, these public art projects or whatnot, um, have more of a voice than just an aesthetic. So. Something a little out of ordinary because we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to ask Gabby to read like three or four other questions and then we're going to get into the final question and then uh, tag out on this. So Gabby, give us some really good uh, things that people are saying that we will follow up on and give to the panel so that they can answer the questions. We will post them on 5 by 5 on Facebook uh, for at, at a later date. But go ahead, Gabby, tell us what folks are saying. Okay, so I've got several folks asking to hear from Cameron. So Cameron, <laughs> want to hear from you next. Um, I've got a lot of people asking questions about um, like place and and space, and in specifically about the the murals um, or the plywood, and what people how important are artist owned and operated buildings. Um, somebody requested a center for peace and justice, maybe a center in um, George Floyd's memory, um, a community building that's black owned. Um, so kind of how to like build that space and what that means for the community. Um, I've also got a question here from Christine that says, it's been difficult seeing how quickly some art has just disappeared. As an observer, the art is part of my mourning process. Is the process of creating part, art part of your grieving process? Um, and I think that's related to a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, I think we would love to be able to answer that question. We did talk a lot about it. And um, like I said, again, we're going to make sure that we try to answer as many as we can. But I, as the clock ticks down, the, the big question everybody really gathered here of the eight, 383 people that are left is, what are the next steps? Some people suggested a center. Some people suggest a, a place that's private. There are museums that want to collect this. There are people that are, are private people, that are collectors. What is the respectful way to do this and ensure that the works don't gather dust and storage, that there's a, a chance for them to be seen and discussed and included in community conversations that can be addressed about race and class and ownership of art and the full uncensored history of African Americans? Um, I feel like my immediate response to the idea that everything has to be stored and consolidated almost, uh, going back to what Alex was talking about, it almost minimizes what happens. I don't think you'll ever be able to fully understand unless you see these murals in every corner of Minneapolis. You know, it's different to be able to walk down almost like what would be an empty street and then be reminded. Like it's, it's so much it's so much so a spatial experience as it is like a visual experience you, you feel engulfed by everything that's going on and i think that's something that you know i was sure we can we can keep and i don't think it should belong necessarily to any one person because it's it's ours it's ours to own it's like it was our wrongdoing it was our injustice it was our you know murder it's our trauma collectively so i don't i don't think any museum should own any of this and then Moving forward, I'd say abolition, infiltration. I think a lot of the conversations we're talking about um, with non-Black people is ultimately rooted um, in them not having an attitude of abolition. You know, what does it mean to completely uproot something? What does it mean? It's a radical idea, right? It's pulling at the roots of something 
And you can only actually truly do that if Black people are at the forefront, if the people who are facing the most violence from the system are leading. And you, like, you obviously, you're not being an abolitionist if you think you can just do something without permission from the people who should be, who have the vision for this future because we face that violence. And I think that's in some ways opened up like so many avenues for us. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, when people ask like, I. If somebody asked to see a panel in the Walker, I'd say just give me a, a seat on the board of trustees first, and then we can, you know, we can go from there. Give me like half the seats, low key, and we can go from there. <laughs> Let's take you back on that because I want full disclosure. I, I'm a board member of uh, the Minnesota Museum of American Art, and I sit on a number of different boards in the community, and and oftentimes I'm one of two or three, and I've made it a push to try to contact black board members across the country so that we can have. Uh, an organization that allows us to go back into the community and encourage uh, people of color to be on board. And I, I don't make any apologies from working within the system, but I do believe that sometimes you have to be a subversive, subversive within the system. You have to be a cog in the machine that does not work in order to make sure that the machine understands it has to change the way it's structured. Um, uh, incrementalism will not fix this. Incrementalism is the special anti-blackness baked into white liberalism here in Minnesota. So um, we have please to think wait, please wait. <laughs> We're going to do this eventually. <laughs> right. And I'm saying we have 3M, we have um, Best Buy, Target, all these places and still the largest disparities in the nation. So we must think big, huge, sweeping, systemic, not, not incrementalism. It's not going to happen. Or we'll, we'll just make more boards because there'll be more burning buildings. Please don't just nod. Say, say your piece. We got uh, about 12 minutes. Say your piece. And I'm being schooled. I appreciate this. I appreciate listening to y'all. So that's it. Well, one of the things that I've done is I have retired from the trying to teach white folks what is right business. So I, I'm, what I want to do is focus on us creating our own institutions and making these decisions, we need to be making the decisions on what happens with, with our stuff. Uh, and however that's done, you know, one thing that I saw floated in an email chain is that we need to create maybe a community arts council of some sort. Uh, I mean, getting back to what Robin said, it, we have all of these things that, tie us together. We need to really wrap that up around ourselves and, and, focus, on, and focus on ourselves. Yeah, but I think uh, I'm like Reggie, like I'm really just getting like school here. This is great. But I wanted to just sort of piggyback on something Cameron said about the, the importance of the space. And I think, you know, this ties into something that people were saying earlier about the way that the art and the, the sort of elements of everything that had happened, the visual elements of everything that's happened, the evidence, I guess you might say, is going to disappear. And there's a lot of people out there who would want to put that stuff in a museum, go back to, you know, everything as normal and be able to talk about that great moment when there was this uh, uprising thing happened and we all went out into the streets. It's the same thing like when people are talking about our march with Martin Luther King, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, everybody, every white person I ever met mar marched with Martin Luther King, right? Like, um, and so that, but nothing changed, right? So here's the thing is like, we need to um, work on ways to transform the space that we live in as well as the, everything else that everybody's talking about. There's no, you go down south, there's like markers for where things happen. There is, you know, there's reminders of what took place in places. And to me, the art on the street as it is right now, or as it was two weeks ago, was markers of things that were happening, of things that people were feeling, of ways that people were responding to, the ways that they have had to live in this place. Um, and that, I don't want that all to just disappear. I don't think any of us wants it all to just disappear. So I almost feel like rather than, you know, obviously we're not collecting physical pieces of art but i almost feel like i want don't take the the pieces down and put them in a 
in a warehouse, take them and put them actually next to the street, take them and put them in more prominent locations where, where people can't avoid seeing them, where people can't, you know, sort of go on with their life as if that this never happened, you know? So I, I think that, you know, there's a story that's going to be told about this and we need to tell it, tell our own story. Um, every museum that wants these boards is going to try to tell a story about what happens here. And that story will be under, you know, at the control of, the, of that museum and the way that they curate, the way that they display the stuff, like we need to tell our own story. And so, I mean, in a way people might say we're part of the problem. I don't know. We're, what we want is to collect the images for people to do with what they want. If we don't own it, the people own it. And I don't know what people will do with it. I hope they'll do research. I hope they'll look, I don't know what they'll do with it. But we're just trying to put it in a place where people can have access to it. And it's not the actual stuff. It's just pictures of it, you know, but I still, I think like what we do with that art is so, so important. And I don't want to just see it, you know, stacked away in museums for people to go in and be like, oh, remember when that happened? Yeah, but we've come so long, so far since then. Uh, yeah, you know, the, whole, hey, oh, go the ahead. thing is, this is, this is, you know, this is a thing with panels that will deteriorate sometimes. And I've had panels up that have deteriorated. But to get a group of artists together to figure out with architects, with engineers, how we might be able to use that. Actually, is there a building or is there a site that might have fencing that it can all go around? And then when that, you know, in those neighborhoods and those communities, these are things that we're going to have to look at a lot tighter. But then institutionalizing, we have to create more places where this won't be a question, you know, um, but there has to be property for this, these panels to go on. But the problem is the ones in St. Paul will go to Minneapolis, you know, you want to have them, like you were saying, in those areas. And it might be a thing where sites can be created that are not being built on right now, that these can be uh, structurally put together so people can go and mourn some more. You know, feel it some more. This mural that got put up at the store, nobody had ever, nobody had even cried hardly before something happened like that. So it felt like a carpetbagger came in. So we have to, you know, keep looking at these things, talking about them, but institutions do have to be made. Um, where they go now, um, what's the, what's the, uh, the theater arts place on uh, university? Um, uh, I can't think of it now. But Naina runs it, you know, I thought that could be a place where things could go. But wherever it goes, it, sounds, it keeps on feeling like it's going to get stored. So your idea about putting it somewhere, you know, maybe that's some fencing that could be built up and put on it. However, then we're exposing it to other people to do other things to it that might not be of a like mind. So we always have to think of that, too. You know, so what you're doing keeps it the way it was when it was. The store owners want the stuff down because they have to start their business again. So there's this real different kind of play on this than I've ever seen before. I, you know what I love seeing? I love seeing John Baker's work in HBCUs in black space. That, that was super important um, to see a, a, a lot of his artwork in, in black space. So HBCUs could be a, could be a possible. Um, or the Harold Washington Library, a library mm -hmm. that was like, like, so a black building, black space, I think that's like the like the appropriate place, um, but somewhere where it is black space, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Let me say a couple things, and then I'm going to shut up. One is, and Roger was absolutely right. Minutes ago, maybe an hour ago, when he said that there are some of the some businesses that needed to go away. Uh, at the same time, you know, we can bring those panels back out on the street. But unless we have some way to sustain them, all they're going to do is warp and fade. Uh, right. And related to that is the fact that the buildings that many of the buildings that burned in Chicago, Detroit, and Newark in 67 and 68, those spaces remain vacant. Uh, those, some of those lots have never been developed adding to disinvestment in our community uh, is one thing that we have to keep in mind that in terms of building and developing community. You know, so we have to bring these, if we bring them back, 
that we need to bring them back alive. And then the last, I'm going to ask a question. I mean, what if, and I know that they're interested, what if the National Museum of African uh, American History and Culture were interested in collecting these panels? What will we feel about that? They are interested. I, I've seen an email from someone who's, who's looking at that. So they're, they're going to come. And, and so people who are, uh, you know, uh, black directed collectors of these panels have to sort of come forward and, and speak directly to them. Also, too, to jump off of something that Say Two said a few moments ago is that, and it's kind of a double edged sword, how I'm going to say this slightly, is that it's the artist's choice. Um, if they if they even want their work in a museum, because there may be someone who just did it for that moment, kind of like how Reggie was speaking earlier. Uh, it may be someone who just did it for that moment because their community wasn't getting as much art because their community wasn't seeing as much love and they just wanted that for that moment. If it goes away, they're not hurt by it. If it comes back, it, they're not hurt by it. But it should ultimately be the artist's decision where it goes. I don't think anyone should be reprimanded in saying, you did such a beautiful piece of work. Why would you not want to preserve it? Well, some people, you know, you make art and then you're like, hey, do it. I don't, it is what it is. Um, I don't think all the art or really any of the art should go to museums because we, I won't say the name of the group when they came here because they're very irrelevant. But one thing that this group of women when they had came to Minnesota had discovered was that there was 10, thousand or that let's just say thousands of pieces in the walkers basement that had never came up for years and years and years and that would be including my stuff you see what i mean so that would be very unfortunate to think that any entity right because this is i guess this is kind of where i go into this space of who do you really want to trust in this moment when it comes to preserving artwork and someone having your artwork. And I also say it's a double-edged sword because, and I see people saying like, well, we, sh we need to make our own things and we need to, we just, we need to put it in our own spaces. And I think that's very realistic too. But you know, we can't all be like, hey, let's all put it at Juxta, right? That's like, that's, that's, that's not realistic. Right, right. Like our artwork has to be, everywhere um right. but it also at the end of every single moment and at the end of every single day should be the artist's choice so if the artists want to put it in a museum do your thing live your life so yeah i mean the last, word there. I'm not, the last word i hate to say that but we are out of time and well, it is, I, thank I, you i am so thankful to everybody who participated in this i am really overwhelmed and overjoyed. This was a lesson for everybody. Five by Five is going to do more of these panels with many other organizations. Uh, thank you, Reggie LaFleur, Todd Lawrence, Roger Cummings, Alex Smith, Choma Uwago, Gabby Cole, Satu Jones, Takumba Aiken, Precious Wallace, Cameron Downey, Curtis Bjorki for hanging in there with all of us and, and getting everything up. Uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors, uh, and if I can do that as quickly as I possibly can, Public Arts St. Paul, Justice Position Arts, MCAD, Kingpin Studio, Ray McKenzie Group, Camo J Radio, University of St. Thomas, Ramsey County Historical Society, Minnesota Museum of Art, and the Afri African American Interpretive Center of Minnesota, the American Institute of Architects in Minnesota, the National Organization of Minority Architects in Minnesota. This Ooh. has been recorded, is live streamed. You will be able to uh, pick this up again. Mm -hmm. Contact us at 5x5art.com or mmaa.org to get more information. Also contact uh, Urban Art Mapping at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, go online and look everybody up. Reggie LaFleur, uh, Just Position Art. Make sure you keep stay, stay too fed so he doesn't eat before our meeting. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much. Uh, this was a wonderful experience and uh, God bless you all. And thank you to our audience for participating. We hope you'll join us again. Shout Real love and virtual hugs. All right. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying there's still 300 and some people here. We can play hey, all this right. all night. <laughs> Let's <laughs> party. Hang it up by yourself. <laughs> Let's start with that uh, GoFundMe G-Wagon.
Right, yo, I'm trying to make it happen. I need, I need to go ahead and, and uh, get that GoFundMe up there for sure. Or right. people can just subscribe to my OnlyFans page coming up in August. Also, can I do the same with plugs? It's not like it's needed. But um, and, and a part of being a self-taught designer, I also would like to say thank you to Juxta because I actually worked at Juxta at a point in time and did both of my internships. So thank you. <laughs> uh, that All made love. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Oh, damn. <laughs>